how he Brother, was justified. Real quick, in law. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you because you were just speaking on something. Uh, do you are you of the? And if, I know this might be a long teaching for you, but just real quick, your quick opinion. It, do you believe Joseph is the father or not? So you asking me from my personal perspective? <laughs> or script by, based, based upon scripture, based upon your understanding of scripture. Um. Well, that's a that's a multifaceted question. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you my subscription. I don't subscribe to the virgin birth, um, and I don't because I don't just look at what we have today known as the Bible. I look through history, and I do what's called textual criticism, which means that I look at all the available evidence because there's not one manuscript for the New Testament, just like there's not one manuscript for the Tanakh or the Torah. There's thousands of manuscripts, thousands. I've went through a couple of hundred. I haven't gone through all the thousands. It's just very overwhelming to do. And I do so many other things. I never have the time to do it. But I went through hundreds from various text-type families. And upon examining them, I realized that the virgin birth story is not consistent in all of these manuscripts, which means that it is one of many traditions but it is the tradition that survives in the Greek translation. If you read, um, if you read uh, the works of Jerome, in 393 A.D., Jerome wrote a dissertation. And in Jerome's dissertation, he says, we know that the book of Matthew was originally written in the Hebrew tongue and authored by Matthew. But the Greek translation, we don't know who wrote it. We don't know who translated it. We have no clue. This is what Jerome said. And Jerome is responsible for helping the Vulgate develop. So Mm. he even knew during his time he had a copy of the book of Matthew in Hebrew. And he had the Greek manuscripts. And he knew from what was told to him by the Nazarenes, who was one of those sects of Jewish Christianity. And in the 4th century, they converted to Accept the virgin birth. You know why? Because after the Nicene Council occurred, there were several other councils that happened after that, and now this Christianity ideology has now gained political favor, which means that now somebody's theology can be enforced by the sword. So that means if you believe or subscribe to something that's contrary to the state religion, you will be put to death, you will be excommunicated, and your works will be burnt and destroyed. So now these sects, that were not killed off, had to convert and either be Christians or convert and either be Yahudim. There's no in-between. You had to be one of the polar opposites. So, so I say that, brother, to answer your question, to say my subscription is based on looking at all the available data that I have at my disposal, and from there, inducing. That means I'm not coming from a point of a presuppositional idea meaning I already have a doctrine formulated in my head before I look at the evidence. I flush that, I take into account all the evidence, and from there I work my way up to a hypothesis, and from a hypothesis to a thesis, and from that conclusion I pray on it, and the Most High confirms it to me. So my stance is I don't subscribe to the virgin birth because I've looked at a myriad of evidence that a lot, or data that a lot of people are not looking at because they are not aware that it exists. So my ministry is designed to bring these things to light so people can look at the same thing that I'm looking at and come to their own conclusions, whatever the Most High convicts you to do. So I'm not saying the virgin birth is wrong altogether. I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is, based on my research and the data that I've acclimated and assessed and analyzed, I see that it is not a consistent tradition, and it has only been consistent through Gentile converts. And Gentile converts are the ones that promoted this ideology. I'm going to show you something real deep, and, I'm, and, and, and this will just touch on that real quick, because I know it's, it's a sidetrack, but it's a good sidetrack. Whoever translated the book of Matthew did not read the Hebrew manuscript. Whoever translated the book of Matthew into Koine Greek, because if we have several church fathers, Epiphanes is another one, who all say the original book of Hebrew was written, uh, Matthew was written in Hebrew. They don't, they don't mm-hmm. argue or disagree. They all agree it was written with Hebrew, but we have also some Greek translation that's floating around. <laughs> they just have it. Jerome said we don't know who wrote it. Go look it up if you don't believe me. Jerome said we don't know who translated this. We have no clue. So whoever mm-hmm. translated that did not read the Hebrew. Whoever translated that translated it 
and their understanding was based on the Septuagint. And I'm going to explain to you what I mean by that. These original followers who were called Jewish Christians, especially, more particularly the Ebionites, you can go look up the Gospel of the Ebionites. This is what they coined the phrase Christianity. They call it the Gospel of the Ebionites, but that's not true. They say it's a corrupted version of the Hebrew book of Matthew, which is not true but I don't have enough time to actually go into it. But if you read it, you'll see that they don't even have Matthew chapter 1, verse 17 on the story. They just don't have that section there in their Hebrew uh, version. It picks up at verse 3, I mean chapter 3. It has none of that virgin birth story. So none of that is in, their, in, in the Hebrew manuscripts that those Ebionites had in their possession. They didn't have none of that. Mm-hmm. It, it was the same way that we have the book of Mark. And a book of Mark, doesn't have the virgin birth story in it. The book of John doesn't have the virgin birth. Matter of fact, the epistles of Shaul or Paul, who was the largest proponent of promoting the deity of Yahusha, he never mentions the virgin birth. And when we do textual analysis of the text in, in, in the scholarly realm, they've determined that the Pauline epistles is earlier than the synoptic gospels and the book of Yachin on John. So if we, if, if, if Paul's writings precedes the laying down of the synoptic gospels and he does not mention a virgin birth, that means that there is more than one tradition that is being maintained concurrently or simultaneously. I'm of the tradition that that was an interpolation by the translator of the Greek manuscript based on what I've assessed and the data that I have acclimated. And I have a lecture coming up where I give out all my information. It's called Immaculate Deception. And I give out all that information that I have so you can sift through the same things that I, I sifted through and see if you come to the same conclusion or a different one. Whatever it is, that's your personal conviction with the Most High. I'm not here to tell you wrong. I'm just showing you what I looked at and what convinced me to stand on what I subscribe to be the truth. Right, and, that's, and, I, and I'm very careful with my words. What I subscribe to be the truth. I never definitively speak on behalf of the Most High because I can change in two, five years from now because the Most High reveals something to me or I come across something new. So I tell you where I stand today and based on my research, subscription, and being led as much as I am to this information, I don't subscribe to the virgin birth because in Matthew chapter 1 going to verse 18 on, again, Matthew chapter 1 to 17, if you go to... The, and I'm going to give you a reference. If you go to the, Sinatic, the Syriac Sinaticus, look it up. Syriac, S-Y-R-I-A-C, Sinaticus, S-I-N-A-I-T-I-C-U-S. That is a manuscript that is written in the Syriac, just like the Peshitta is written in the, Pesiria, in the Syriac. When you read Matthew chapter 1, verse 17 there, you know what it says? Yosef begot Yahusha. But when you read Matthew chapter 1, verse 17, and the Greek manuscript, it don't say that. Mm. Mm. That's interesting. And do you know where the majority of the manuscripts that our English translation is translated from? The Byzantine text type. Do you know what the Byzantine text type is? It's what's called the majority text. And do you know when that became popular? During the Middle Ages, when Christianity moved its home base to Byzantium in Turkey. So, by the time we get to Byzantium in Turkey, we have interpolations in manuscripts that we don't find in the Alexandrian text type, which is much earlier, which is found in Alexandrian Egypt. So, when they moved, a different ideology started to emerge because there were successive councils with rulings on creeds that was put out forth by the Roman Catholic Church. And the manuscripts had to align themselves with these rulings. And then from those Byzantium text type family manuscripts came the majority text, which was what's called the received text. The Textus Receptus, which is a, a, a Greek manuscript that was based on Stephanos, Beza, and Erasmus, and their Greek manuscripts, the translators looked at all these Greek manuscripts and the Vulgate, and what they decided was, okay, if we look at all these manuscripts, how can we craft up the best Greek manuscript? They created the Texas Receptus using textual criticism methods over several manuscripts, and from that they translated it into the King James 
1611 Bible that you have today. Most people don't read the preface, but they don't know this stuff. When you don't read the preface, the first thing I read in the book is the preface. It's there for a reason. The preface gives you the will and intent of why this book is being written. It tells you why. <laughs> why do we translate it this way? Why do we do what we do? All the information is there. We just never read it. We go straight to the Bible. So what I'm saying is, what we have is a tradition that comes from the Byzantium text type family, and that there are other manuscripts that do not agree with it. And they are earlier than these Byzantium text type manuscript family. Family, what I'm telling you is very important, and a lot of people, unfortunately, um, are not aware to do this type of study. We assume a lot of things because this is the way we've been taught. But my objective is to be objective and to give you tools and resources so you can do your own independent study and see where the Ruach leads you. That's why I was safely said what I said, my brother. I did not say that there is no virgin birth. I don't speak like that. I say my subscription is that I do not side with that tradition. There was two traditions that was captured in the manuscripts, one that sides with the virgin birth and one that doesn't. And from my research, the ones that side with the virgin birth is mostly the Greek manuscripts. But the Syriac and Hebrew, the originals, did not have that. You know why? Because it was not important. You're going to be like, what? It was not important? No. You don't need to know that for salvation. Why do you need to know that for yeah. salvation? Whoever translated Matthew chapter 1, use a reference in Yeshayahu uh, chapter 7, verse 14, right, where it says a virgin shall give birth. You know, they use that a lot because in the Greek, the word is parthenos. Parthenos is what they use today as a process called parthenogenesis. Parthenogenesis is where a female, um, a female uh, amphibian, lizard, snake, worm, female, anything that has a gamete, the gamete is the genes that designates your gender. That that individual, that female individual, can clone, make a clone, produce a clone through the process of meiosis, right, initiated meiosis, where they provide their own spike because the sperm provides the calcium spike in order to jumpstart the process of meiosis. So they're able to initiate that process and give birth to an offspring that has only, listen to this, only the chromosomes of the mother, which means that they will always be female. You know why? Because you need the father's DNA in, or in chromosomes in order to determine whether you're going to turn from that X to a Y. So mm -hmm. this is the concept of a clone that is being produced. So that word parthenos, it, remember the Greek language is not what the Hebrews were speaking. But they, but somebody, whoever translated this had to use the closest word that they knew in Greek in order to make their point. But you've got to go back to the Hebrew. So Parthenos was also used in a lot of the classical Greek texts that talked about Zeus and Hercules and all of these demigods. They used the same term mm -hmm. to, in, to imply that a person is not born of an earthly father. Zeus is not a man. Mm -hmm. So when Zeus goes and lies with a woman and gives birth to a demigod, that person has a Parthenos birth. What is a Parthenos birth? That means, uh, being that Zeus is not a man, he has put some kind of spiritual force into this woman to force a child to be born. But when you read the Hebrew, the Hebrew is specific. You have Betula and you have um, Alma. Two different words that imply two different things that does not have the Greek understanding behind it. So the Greek translates Bethula and Alma the same. It's the same word, Parthenos. Whoever was reading the Septuagint when they inserted that into the book of Matthew did not understand Hebrew. They didn't understand Hebrew. And if they did understand Hebrew, what they would have done is transcribe the word. See, if I can't find a word in English to match a word in Spanish, I'll transcribe it. If I can't find a word in Spanish to match a word in Chinese, I'll transcribe it which means that I'm going to keep the closest rendering in regards to phonology or phonetics and orthography, the way something is spelled, to retain its essence because it has to be loaned to this cultural dialect because it is not in the indigenous dialect. Let me rewind, rewind that again. Hopefully you're following. What I'm saying is I would have transcribed, because you can transcribe Hebrew into Greek. You can do that, right? And we have a lot of those in Hebrew. For example, 
uh, we have the word uh, Rabboni. Rabboni, Racha, these are all Aramaic words. But they're not, they, they're, they're transcribed into Greek, but they retain the same phones, which is the phonetics, the way you pronounce it, that it is said in the Hebrew or the Aramaic. So whoever translated that, all they did was copy a script. They said, oh, virgin, giving birth. Oh, shoot. Wait, hold on. Yo, we, we support this tradition. Man, let's take that verse and let's put it in here to substantiate Yahusha. Because we got to get around the curse of Jeconiah. Because they obviously didn't understand that curse either. Because if they read the Hebrew, you would understand that. So we got to mm-hmm. circumvent this curse of Yaconiah. So let's put this virgin birth thing in there. Let's insert this in there. That way we can get around the, the, the uh, Yaconiah curse. And also, we can fulfill better sheep, chapter 3, verse 15, which says that your seed, which is Zedekah, Ka is the Hebrew suffix meaning your, Zedah means seed, your seed, and they and her seed, Zedekah. Zera is masculine of seed, and ah is feminine. So when you add ah to zera, you're saying her seed. Your seed, serpent, and her seed, I will put enmity between the two. And somebody's going to crush somebody's head, somebody's going to crush somebody's heel, right? We got to use that. Man, look, if we, if we put this virgin birth, we can appeal to this. But that means, that goes to show that whoever's reading this is reading the Septuagint because they don't understand Hebrew morphology. If you understand Hebrew grammar, then you can be able to discern a text that a person with a Western mind will not understand. So when they talk about this virgin birth situation, they tie it to Genesis 3 and 15, that is a shot in the dark, and you're missing blindly. That has nothing to do with a physical Messiah coming to redeem. That has to do with somebody out of the lineage of the one human being that's being birthed, because before then, Adam and Eve didn't have children. The serpent didn't see no children come from Adam and Eve. He didn't see that. They didn't have any children at that point. According to the text and, and within uh, Genesis chapter 3, we don't see any children roaming around with them. If they had them or not, that's a different story, but the text is not explicit about it. So now when something is happening to this woman where she's actually given birth, that is telling this serpent that remember when you thought you beguiled her and you thought you had the upper hand? Now every time you see a woman giving birth, guess what? They're, they're going to build a nation or an entity that's going to do something against you. We see this in Revelation chapter 12, which is very interesting because it talks about the woman who's hiding in the wilderness and she gave birth to the man-child and a woman being Israel, man-child being in Yahusha. But Yahusha also inducts his followers who are the priesthood that he uses. That's what we see in Revelation chapter 1 verse 6 where it says he made us a kingdom of priests. He sure did because you're after the orphan of the deck now, not Levites. So now we see a situation where we actually, when we actually look at the text and it's Hebraic prose, we can extract from it what the author intended for the audience because the audience were not messianics, right? The audience were not Christians. The audience was other Yahudim, and that's who it's being written to. So you can't have a Western writer or a Western translator that is reading something in Greek that originally was not written in Greek and is cherry-picking verses to add, to create these prophecies to validate Yahusha, when you can just simply mm-hmm. make the case I did earlier without using any of that stuff. Yeah. Simply. I didn't, I didn't use really no, no prophecies. I only addressed them because somebody brought it up. I can make a whole case for Yahusha without referring to one prophecy mentioned in B'ri Hadashah. Mm-hmm. And when you're able wow, to do yeah. that, you can, convey that, you can convey a true Messianic worldview without having to rely upon the same tactics that Christians use. Because when a person who's not only hears Christian tactics to convey their worldview, they automatically shut down and they shut it off. But if you can mm-hmm. take them through the Tanakh, through the Talmud, through the Dead Sea Scrolls, and make a case for Yahusha, and then, then link it, once you get them to agree as they walk, which you got to walk with them slow, Walk with them slow for things that they've never seen before in the Tanakh, things that they've never seen before in the Tanakh. Walk them through it very slowly. Uh, manuscripts they've never seen in the Dead Sea Scrolls. I walk them through it. I get through to the point and say, you know what, I agree, man. I didn't see that before. That's good, blah, blah, blah. And I said, you know who realized the, the, the weaving of all of this information that we just went over? The writers or authors of the Rit Hadashah. And this is why they proposed their subscription to Yahusha meeting this criteria and certain prophecies. They're not, they're not going to prophecies. 
then certain prophecies also validate that. And now mm-hmm. with this methodology, you're working with them from the Torah first, not from the New Testament back, like Christians do, but from the Torah first mm-hmm. forward. They will receive mm-hmm. it more. Now it'll start to make sense from their worldview. They're not going to have any mm-hmm. hang-ups because the angle you're coming from is going to be different than that of a Christian. So that's all I that's all I wanted to add on that, my brother. And this is not to belittle anybody that's virgin birth. I mean, if you do, all power to you. I'm not saying you're wrong at all. I'm just saying from my extensive research, which I still have to do more, because I haven't even, have even scratched the surface. Even with all of the comprehensive stuff that I've accumulated, there's still more data out there. All I'm saying is I looked at the data and I flushed away any preconceived notions or presuppositions that I had, and I said, let me work from the data and move my way up. And that's when I realized there were two separate traditions, and the one that was supported uh, the virgin birth were mostly Gentile converts in the, by the way of the uh, church fathers and whoever this, this, these anonymous uh, translators of the Hebrew book of Matthew. And there was a tradition that was kept by the Ebionites and Nazarenes and the other Jewish, so-called Jewish Christian uh, sects who did not have this virgin birth story in their book of Matthew that they were walking around with. So I mm-hmm. tend to lean towards those individuals because they were identified as being Israelites and direct descendants of the, those who have been discipled by, by the disciples and who carried on the lineage. A convert comes from a Gentile outside and making their way in. Somebody that's already in the know is somebody that will definitely give you a better point of view than somebody from the outside coming in. So that, that's why I subscribe to that, my brother. I hope that's an honest and transparent answer for you. 